Good evening, everyone. My name is Joyce Trotman Jordan. I am a board member at Not Nerd Town, and we begin all of our sessions with our land acknowledgement. The land on which we are living is part of the ancient home, homeland and traditional territory of the Lenni Lenape people. We pay respect to the Lenni Lenape people, past, present, and future, and their continuing presence in their homeland and in the diaspora. We also acknowledge the millions of enslaved Africans and their descendants on whose backs this nation was created. Not in our town mission statement. Not in our town, Princeton is a multiracial, multi faith group of individuals who stand together for racial justice and inclusive communities. Our focus is to promote the equitable treatment of all and to uncover and confront white supremacy, the system that facilitates the preference, privilege, and power of white people at the expense of non-white people and pits racial and ethnic groups against each other by upholding hierarchies based on proximity to whiteness. Our goal is to identify and expose the political, economical, and cultural systems which have enabled white supremacy to flourish and to create new structures and policies which will ensure equity and inclusion for all. In our commitment to uncovering the blight of white supremacy on our humanity, we take responsibility to address it and eliminate it in all its forms through intentional actions, starting with ourselves and our communities. It gives me great pleasure this evening to introduce our speaker. The Institution of Anti-Racism Education is committed to ensuring that every student receive education that is truthful, free from bias, liberating, and offered in a supportive, decolonizing setting. Ashley Liscom, the CEO of this Institute, for, uh, the Institute of Anti-Racism Education will discuss lessons learned and give guidance for those of us that would like to do similar works in our school districts and in our communities. I am so looking forward to Ashley's conversation tonight with us as we sit back, take notes and see what it is that we can glean from her expertise. Thank you, take it away, Ashley. Thank you, Joyce, for that introduction. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ashley, she, her pronouns. I must give a caveat. I am not in a quiet space as I usually am. I had an emergency with a family member who is currently uh, in the ER. So hopefully, we're hoping that right now it doesn't get too, too loud. So uh, it's okay, you know. I'm a praying woman, so I'm believing God for wonderful things. I heard that this is a group here who are of mixed faith, so we understand for some of us where that faith comes from. Uh, so I wanted to start tonight as we have our conversation. Now, I did tell them I am a preacher, so I will go over time. So you do have to tell me if I'm here too long, uh, but I will give some insights tonight about some of my work, some of my partnerships, and of course, it gets loud just when it was like my time to talk, right? It was just quiet. Um, but yeah, so I'll give you some more insights about my work, who I am, how I come to this work, and some things that I offer. But before we get into any of that, I always like to start with a question. And that question simply is, how is your breathing? That's how we're going to come in tonight. That's how we're going to engage our discussion uh, about some of the work that we do. And so the question is, how is your breathing? I want us to think about that. As we think about it, I want us to take some time for breath and reflection. So I'm gonna invite you, if you have something to write with, 
to take two minutes to just kind of write down your thoughts about this. How is my breathing today, right? Is it expansive? Is it restricted? Is it stretched? Is it rushed? Is it full? How is my breathing? So I'm going to take about two minutes. So 7.09, now we'll come back at around uh, 7.11, 7.12. I even give us till 7.12. And then I want some people to kind of share out and reflect on what it is that you wrote down uh, or what it is that you reflected on in this moment. Sound good? Give me a thumbs up. We're good here. All right. So you're going to write down the question, how is your breathing? And I want us to do some reflection. I'll turn my mic back on around 712, okay? You'll be okay, but you know, yeah. But you know, remember that. Don't be doing, you know, if you say to yourself, oh, maybe I'll stop off and do something. No. Okay, it's just a reminder, we have about one minute, one minute left, it's 7-Eleven now, so let's wrap up our thoughts. Okay, that, thank you, Linda, for putting that in the chat, that question. Uh, I'd love to hear some responses. Would anyone like to kind of come off mute and respond? What did you reflect on? What did you write down? Uh, how was your breathing today? I'd love to hear. All right, I can go. This, this is Joyce. So today I've noticed the minute you said it that my breathing is very shallow, almost sparse, mindless and not focused. Thank you, right? Yeah. The minute we asked that question. I knew exactly, yeah. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, anyone else? Anyone else is breathing as far as how is your breathing? How are you connecting with your body in this moment? Hello, it's Bob here. Um, I said unnoticeable, calm, Comfortable, peaceful. Thank you. You know, I'm actually gonna take some of that for myself. <laughs> Calm, peaceful. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take some of that in this moment. Uh, anyone else will take one more person. How is your breathing in this moment, in this space? So I, I will say that um, when you said that, I realized that, you know, I've had a rough day and my breathing was not great. But as soon as you asked the question, I started to relax. I mean, so that yeah, you really helped me through the day. And that's why I always ask this question. When I'm in these spaces, when I'm leading workshops, when I'm working with schools, it is a way for us to remember that we are living beings in our bodies. 
And we go through the day and we have yet to kind of settle and reflect on how our breathing grounds us, even in this moment, right? In real time for me, <laughs> as I, you know, got that call to have to rush to the, the ER immediately, I began to breathe deep as a response because I've sort of trained myself to rely on the breath to ground and center me. So even as we have conversations, as you do in this group, right, where sometimes we don't always agree, we don't always have to go in the same direction, we're not understanding each other, my, my reminder is to always come back to the breath, right? Always come back to, hopefully it's not too loud, so sorry, but always come back to the breath because it will remind you of why you're here in the first place, what your body is able to handle what it can navigate. Uh, and so usually uh, when I'm working with my clients, when I'm working with students now, even as I began in the corporate space, we kind of forget that we are a part of the body and we separate our, separate it from you know, our everyday. And so really the work then is to sort of bring us back to, again, the ways in which we show up in our body. So thank you so much for reflecting on that. I, I hope that you take this little journal reflection with you. And uh, next time you have a crazy day, a long week, and you say to yourself, I need a break. <laughs> that break can happen in 30 seconds if you just take it in the moment where you even think about it, right? Uh, so thank you so much for doing that. A little bit more about me and who I am. Uh, again, my name is Ashley, she, her pronouns. Uh, I usually like to say I am a daughter. I am a niece. I am a sister. I am a friend. I'm an educator. I'm a reverend some days. I'm a little radical on other days. Uh, in most days, I'm just a mess. <laughs> and in this moment, I'm trying to figure out who I actually am. And so just a little bit about me, that's who I am and that's how I show up in the space. Uh, yes, we founded the Institute in 2020 and it has been a wild ride and we've learned so much on the journey that I wanted to kind of offer some of our learnings here in this space with all of you. And so as uh, an institute, some of the things that we do, we don't just partner with schools. Our work stretches beyond that. Our work is to center students first, to think about students first and their needs. How do we show up for them? How do we care for them? And I'm passionate about students. I was an educator for several years. As a reverend, I am a youth minister. So I've journeyed with students on a spiritual platform. And so that work for me has always centered healing. How do I call students to know and to navigate what healing is? How do I help them to name what healing looks like for them in their lives? We usually forget that young people are living beings who are going through so much, just like we are, <laughs> right? Uh, there's so much in the world that siphons our energy. And although young people are resilient and they can snap back in different ways than we can, uh, they are still young people who need us to recognize their humanity. They are still young people who need us to care for them and to cover and keep them. And so that's the work that I do. I help schools and organizations learn how to love on young people better. <laughs> they are the ones who will create the future that we all deserve. They will create the world that we have been waiting for. And so my job is to make sure that we love them in the process, that we do not forget them, that we do not leave out their voices because their voices matter too. And so we bring them to the table. We ask them to join committees. We ask them to lead the changes they would like to see in real time. Uh, so that's a little bit more about the work we do and why we do what we do. Um, and so I wanted to offer some of the lessons that I have learned along the way. And so I just have some five, you know, quick five points uh, that we're gonna share as an infographic with all of you so that you have it. And then also, uh, if you have any questions, I wanna leave some time for questions just in case you wanna know more about our work and what we've seen in our partnerships, what else has been effective. I wanna make sure that you have that information. Um, but some things that we've, uh, some steps that I've noticed that people should take when they're considering uh, partnering with schools and districts in order to love students better. 
the first one is that there is no one size fits all to this work <laughs> you know i believe sometimes we for we, we forget that we all come to this from different experiences and perspectives. And so what works for one school in terms of being more equitable and fair and loving may not work for another school because they don't face similar issues, right? And so one of the things I ask schools when we partner with them is to resist this need to do what someone else has done, to follow someone else's blueprint. What you can create as a school is a community uh, as you partner, it's something unique to what you need. It's unique to all of you. And so the first one is, again, no, si no one size fits all. It's not going to work that way. And I always encourage as you begin to partner with schools, as something that we've seen, is that folks always start with listening. Too often we start this work with assumptions. I'm assuming this is what this school needs. I'm assuming this is what students want. I'm assuming that this is how this work has to happen. But in actuality, the start is just listening. If we listen to what educators need, if we listen to what counselors are saying in our schools, listen to what administrators are struggling with in terms of creating equitable schools, listen to what caregivers, family members, community members are saying that they're also struggling with at home. How do we create loving spaces that go beyond the classroom, that happen in our living rooms, right? As we have these types of partnerships, that starts with listening intently so that we can design our own path towards creating loving schools. And then the second thing that I've learned in the work that I do and the ways in which I partner with schools is that you wanna connect the collective. I love what y'all are doing here, right? Not in our town, Princeton. Okay, I, I, wanna, I wanna steal that just a little bit from my city where I am, right? We let folks know what's happening where we are. You're building a collective toward uh, a shared vision, a shared mission. And so an effective school and community partnership requires a collective of people from different stakeholder groups within a school's ecosystem. So who is that? You wanna build a collective of community members, caregivers, students, teachers, administrators, counselors, and nurses. One thing I've found in this work is if the superintendent is more aligned with what you wanna do, is on board, is at every meeting, the work goes much further, right? You're able to have the resources you need, the support you need in that way. So my suggestion is to ensure that you have different people from different areas within the school, within the community that can create a shared vision, that can um, align the goals for creating more loving schools. Ashley, do you want me to also share it on the screen? Yeah, that would be great if you could. Okay. Thank you so much. Perfect. Uh, and so we're at number two, right? You want to connect the collective, draw people together. Uh, just to kind of give you an example, when I started this work in a community that was really divided, right? They, uh, one half was like, yes, let's do this. The other half was not really feeling it, I'll be honest. And so what we decided to do was to pull together this collective and they are the ones who, they are the ones who design where schools will go. They have discussions about what schools need. They also uh, created the survey that they put out. And in our work, they've been able to assuage the angst of those who are not uh, sure about how this work is going to happen in school. We've had a lot of resistance, right? And so those who are there, who started out and weren't as knowledgeable, were able to get the learning that they needed. So sorry about the background noise. Hold on one second. So as they began to uh, work together, right, 
they were able to have communi com community conversations within their own groups. So students began to talk to students. Uh, we had police officers in there who were able to talk to other members in the community who weren't sure about the work that we were doing. We've had families, we've had board members who were uh, on the Board of Education who were able to speak to at board meetings about the work that we were doing that the collective uh, was trying to do on behalf of the community. And the group now expands throughout uh, the year. We get more and more folks who are interested, more and more folks who want to be there, who want to connect, who are energized about the work. So it's just really important that we consider who we're bringing to the table uh, and why. And then number three is something that you all have done really, really well, right? If you're going to create school and community partnerships, you wanna create a shared vision. As a collective, it's important to clarify what your vision and your mission is. What would you like to see change in your school or district? How will that change happen? How are you going to show up for students? That is an important step that many forget. And creating that shared vision, creating that shared mission provides clarity, a map, for those who are like, well, what is the work we're actually going to do? Who's uh, going to make what change? What policies are we even going to focus on? Especially as we think about what policies are more discriminatory, right? And disproportionately affect the most vulnerable student populations. And by creating this shared vision, you're also able to communicate uh, how important this work is, who this work is for, and why you're doing it in the first place. And then the next part is you also want to develop shared understandings. Now, this part is actually really important because it's a step that a lot of people seem to forget. <laughs> language is important and language changes every day. And so it's important to take time to develop the definitions and the language of anti-racism. Uh, too often we go into it with the assumption that people are on the same page. Until I come in and do a workshop and I ask the question, well, what is anti-racism? What is white supremacy? What is um, all these different terms in which we carry with us and we assume that everyone has uh, the same definitions for, but we do not. We come from, thank you. We come from different areas. We have different focus groups and things like that. And so it's important to sort of define at the end of the day, what uh, these terms are. And when you do that, it also helps creating the shared vision. Everyone understands then how the school, how the community is defining anti-racism. Everyone understands how the school community is defining what the manifestations of racism are and how they impact students. And then the last point here is to resist urgency. We wanna be intentional about your coalition's rate of engagement. Remember, I said it's not a one size fits all. <laughs> so many schools I partner with wanna get something done or changed in the first year, but that's not really how this works. We want to be sure um, that the changes you create are sustainable over time. If we go for the one year quick fixes, people will burn out, they will no longer be invested, right? And we lose that long-term vision. And so we sometimes have to uh, pace the rate by which the community can handle. That doesn't mean that you're not working. It just means that you're working for sustainability. You want the changes to last beyond uh, just what you do while you're a part of the collective. And so that's some of the things or some of the lessons uh, that I've learned in this space. And so it is 7.30, we have a few minutes. I wanna be able to open space for questions. And I really, really do appreciate all of you for being patient with me as I try to navigate this, this moment in this time and this very loud space. So, uh, but I do wanna leave some, some, some opportunities for, for questions and answers before you go into your breakout rooms. Any questions for me? Linda, go ahead. Uh, yes, thank you very much for, for this guidance and these guidelines. My question has to do with the people who don't come to the table, the people who are 
happy and satisfied with a very high achieving school and school system and don't want to see that change and also have um, a lot of power and persuasion within the the school system um, how can you give suggestions as how to deal with that uh, like I said, everything is different for different groups. But one of the things I always love to do is start with questions, right? What questions really will lead us toward uh, the path that we want to go on? So where's there resistance, where there is resistance? One of the things I love to do is to ask that question, why? What about the ideology is causing you to be resistant? Where is this resistance coming from? Is there fear? What are we afraid of? Who is this for? It's a reminder to pull people back to students. What do students need? Which one of our students do not feel loved and why, right? So I love to lead with questions because it always pulls us back to reflection. Um, another point that may be useful is creating or making community connections, right? A conversation goes a long way. How do you have conversations uh, with those who are resistant to the work that you want to do? I do have to just move quickly. So I'm going to move outside where it's hopefully a little less noisy. Um, but that, that's one suggestion that I have. And also, it's just a reminder that not everyone is going to go with you where you're trying to go. <laughs> you can reach who you can, but those who are automatically resistant are never going to really sway to your side. And sometimes that's just the, the, the unfortunate reality that we must navigate. But we do what we can and we hope that as we have conversation, as we ask questions, that we lead to love. So I'm gonna take the next question as I walk outside. Ms. Shot, go ahead. How do uh, you, first get connected with the school system or the district system. Are you invited in uh, or do you approach a school or district and offer help? Uh, how, does, how does that work? Yeah, we are usually invited in. So, well, our, our organization, we sort of became very popular on social media. So because of that, we get a lot of folks who reach out to us, they hear about our work, they get our newsletters, uh, they get our resources. And so they reach out, they ask us these different questions. And based on the types of support they're looking for, then yes, we partner with schools. Um, that seems to be the easiest approach uh, to it. Thank there you. Are, you, mm -hmm. There are some unique cases where it's like, it's a community, it's like a family member who reaches out, they ask what we do, and they'll email the school to connect us as well. So that's another, another way that that happens. Yes, thank you. Has any questions, please feel free to. Um... I have a question. Okay. Um, working in the school system, and trying to bring, as you said, community engagement partners and to recognize, for folks to recognize that something is not right there. All children don't feel that they are in a safe environment. How do we get our administrators to recognize that as we go forward, uh, trying to make sure that all the children feel like they're caring. Oh, I'm gonna get in trouble with this one, but write that letter. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> write the letters, uh, pull people together. You all have a collective here, write a strong statement, reminding the schools uh, of the importance of loving every single student and where there are policies where not every student feels welcomed nor valued nor humanized in the space then it's important to name those specifically. So I've talked about language before. It's important to define language so that you're able to say, this is happening in this way and here's why we must change it, right? 
One quick point as I can think of is, for example, the Crown Act just passed, but there are students who are discriminated against because they have dreads, their hair looks like mine. So it's important to name that if a student is discriminated against within a school's policy based on hair, why that is rooted in white supremacy culture, why that is also a manifestation of racism and access, and how you are expecting administrators to do the work that they need to do to have it to change the policy so that these students are loved. I also suggest that you provide resources. Here's an organization that does this work. I suggest you start talking to them, right? Here's uh, some resources that you can look at as the school has already changed this policy. Here's why we need to bring the collective together. So it's just important to kind of name that this is about loving every child and not every child is loved. And I use language of love as an entry point, but I also want to name uh, I'm, uh, I've studied, right, Martin Luther King, and I've also studied his love justice theology. And one of the people, one of the things that people do, they love to talk about how Martin Luther King talked about peace. But Martin Luther King really talked about how there is no love without justice. There is no justice without love. That is not a world that we can live in. So that requires our acting. Love, for me, even as Bell Hooks defined it, is about care. It's about, um, open and honest communication. Even if we have to correct, it is also about correction. It is an invitation for us to resist, to uh, disrupt those things that are harming those close to us. And it's about taking action to make sure that we uh, create the change for those who we love the most. I bring as an example, I'm here at the emergency room out, out here trying to do what I can to keep this conversation going because I love students that much. I love the work that you're doing, but I also love family, but I think we can do both, right? And that requires me to act, to do. And so that's why I say we must create loving schools. That means that requires us to act, to make change, so that students know this space is for them, right? It's not just about creating a space uh, where they're invited to join the party, but that the party is like, this party is for you. <laughs> <laughs> right? You're not just invited into this space. This space is for you. Uh, and so that's why it's important to do that work. Thank you for that question. But Ashley? Thank you for that too, Ashley. And But at the same time, how do we create folks to understand that we need to be very active of making these type of changes when folks are in denial that we don't have a problem? Data is also a way as an entry point, right? Take a look at the data. What does the data say? Um, what Look at the discipline of students. Student, student discipline data is also a way in. It's a way to, um, here in the state of New Jersey, we know that report cards are also <laughs> very public uh, for the state. So what state test scores look like, we can look at according to race, who is excelling and who is not. These are practical things that we can bring in to also just name. Here's, here's what's realistically happening within the school, within the community, um, and, and here's why we need to make those changes. Now, where folks are still very much resistant, you must be persistent, right? Because I will say this, in our society right now, there are plenty of folks who are loud and wrong. <laughs> that's, what I, that's what I say. They are very loud and also very wrong. <laughs> So you also have to navigate in the noise, but that means that you have to be just as loud, all right? You cannot stop, although we, we may want to give in, um, you know, you, you just can't, can't stop because it gets a little uncomfortable. We have to keep, keep doing the work. And that's something I remind myself of too, right? Even when I'm like, I, I, this work gets harder and harder, you know, as I hear about students calling other students racial slurs that are very close to home. When I hear about the ways in which uh, students who look like me are harmed, it gets very hard to do the work for myself. But I remember that I can't, I love kids too much to, to kind of stop doing this work. Uh, thank you, Ashley. We have a comment. Someone says, I love your blog. <laughs> thank you <laughs> and has put the link very kindly in the chat in case thank anybody you. else wants that and yeah. uh miss yolanda frisbee asks have you had any outreach or interaction with private schools 
Yes. So we've worked in the independent school uh, space as well. Um, we've worked with charter schools, although those are public, but you know, they're a different type of public school. So yes, we, we've had experiences there. Again, for those programs, usually it's an administrator that's reached out. Uh, on occasion, we've had some educators who have spoken to their administrators who've advocated for a workshop from us, who've advocated for some resources. On our website, we have plenty of free resources. So you can register for our newsletter, uh, which I'm going to be writing today. Uh, but we, you can register for our newsletter that goes out every week we, where we provide some uh, resources there. And that's how we also have had um, private schools to reach out to us as well. All right, last chance to ask a question. Oh, Joyce. I, I love that concept of loving all students. I mean, that just says it all for me. And um, going back to um, a point that Linda was making, um, sometimes our school districts can get very, I want to call it, I guess, stoic, and they're very structured, and all of the emphasis is put on the top. So all of these students at the very top with you know, many resources are performing well. So why should we even think about you know, changing anything? But helping parents, and Joanne talked about it too, but helping parents and administrators understand, but are we really loving all of our students? How can we love? How can we invite those children, those young people who are not at the top, who don't have all the resources, how can we invite them into a more equitable um, academic setting or more, you know, because they don't feel, they don't feel included and they feel isolated. And Princeton is a really strange place, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you know. And so also that, what is their responsibility to those students, right? And that's a so good because, question. Yeah. Because the administrators and the other parents do have a responsibility to these children, not just their own. And that seems to be a big stake there, is getting people out of their own heads and into the hearts of, of others in the community. And we have to sometimes go for the, the compassion of it all, right? I was working with a district. I'll never forget a child who was a Black student said to me, I see whiteness all around there are days yeah. I go to school and I wish I was white. I repeated mm -hmm. that to administration. I repeated that to the community so that they can hear what a student has said. That was not me. That was not something I made up. This is not an assumption I made. And automatically when you hear that a student says, I wish I wasn't me, it, it forces you to stop and to pause. Now, I hate that sometimes we have to lean on pain for people to recognize our humanity. Like that's not something that we have to do and it's not something that I always lean on, but there are moments where it is a wake up call for us, right? It is a, a reminder and a responsibility uh, for us to acknowledge that students are living human beings. And I would also say, I, I, I worked in private space. Those students who are performing well academically are also struggling emotionally physically, intellectually. So it's also important yes. to name the ways that white supremacists, sorry, a horn, the ways that white <laughs> supremacist delusions make us believe in perfection in ways right. that students are stressing themselves out to be the best of the best, to get into the best schools where they miss out on opportunities to just be students, to be right. youth, to be kids, and make mistakes. Like that, essentially, we strip them of that moment for them to connect to who they really are so they can meet mm -hmm. the image of who others expect them to be. So yes, thank you. Exactly. Good point, thank you. Thank you so much. I wanna, res I, I know that people are gonna have more questions, but I wanna respect your time. <laughs> oh, yes. Um, and, and I, uh, and get you to your auntie. <laughs> and uh, also so that we can uh, join in conversation. So if everybody could sort of um, clap or shake, wave your hands to thank uh, Mr. Lipscomb so much for joining us this evening, despite everything and sharing uh, so much wisdom and love. Um, and thank you. Thank you all for uh, letting me be in this space for being patient with all the background sounds. I really do appreciate that. 
Um, and one of the things I always love to do when I sign off, and I hope that you all start to do that as well. Whenever I sign off, if you follow me on Instagram, you've heard me say this, you'll hear me say it tonight. Uh, I love people. And so tonight I wanna extend that love to all of you. I love you for who you are because you are a gift to the world, not because you have to be someone else, not because you have to perform someone else's standard of excellence nor uh, uh, exceptionality. I love you simply because you exist. And that is a love that I hope we take with us that, we, that will sustain us. And I want us to extend that love to someone else that we haven't spoken to in a while, that someone else who is near and dear to us. Make sure that we tell the folks out in the world that we love them and we mean it. Because I believe if we continue to say it, we might actually see a better world, a more loving world, mm -hmm. a more kind world. So mm -hmm. please, please, please send that love to someone else. So thank you all. I'm so, so appreciative for yes. being here in this space. Thank you. Thank you. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you, Shelly. <laughs> Welcome back to the big room, everybody. I always say that I feel like a little bit like I've just been in Star Trek with the transporter beam, disassembled and reassembled. Um, I hope that everyone's breakout groups were as fruitful as ours was, and um, that some folks may be moved to share just one or two little thoughts from your group that you think it might be good for other folks to hear. So if you've got, it's a small enough group, you could probably just unmute and say, share a little something from your group if you're if you're in a position to do so. Hi, Shelly, it's Caroline. Hi, Caroline. I was a facilitator. Um, and I, I won't speak for everyone, but I will tell you that um, um, we talked about um, ways in which we can be change agents and um, show up for social justice. And uh, we talked about um, legislation supporting policies, whether it's school policies, school board policies, or um, you know, legislation on the state level. Linda um, pointed out the uh, New Jersey Institute of Social Justice is one of the places where you can learn more about legislation that's uh, pending that impact these issues. And um, uh, we had uh, members of the group whom, you know, they shared their sentiments about um, the disparity in funding for school districts and how those things impact and ultimately result in um, this a very segregated um, state and school district and in turn inequities, right? Unequal funding, you're gonna get unequal results. So um, we talked about ways in which we can, um, in, in, that are being considered to uh, remedy that um, issue, such as regionalization of schools. And I also talked about funding, Joyce, about the state paying their taxes in Trenton. Yes. <laughs> so that we, the taxpayers, wouldn't be so heavily burdened. And Linda's just dropped a link in the chat. Uh, talking about the, the current lawsuit for folks who want to sort of catch up a little bit. Um, thanks very much, Caroline. Is there another group that would like to just briefly share out some of your takeaways? We're always smarter in conversation, I think. Mm -hmm. Roz, is that you waving your hand, raising your hand? Go for it. It, it is, yes. Uh, I was a facilitator in uh, uh, my group. Um, we, uh, we talked about some of the communication challenges um, and some, uh, one person in our group brought up the excellent point that there are language barriers in a lot of our schools. Um, but uh, that, uh, so that's, that's a challenge that we have to uh, grapple with. Um, but we, we latched on to Ashley's very good suggestion that we need to have a common language. We need to agree on terms and on, on the mission that we won't get anywhere in creating an anti-racist uh, community and partnership if we don't uh, have a common mission. 
um, uh, around that. Um, and then we also, I think we were focusing on, on high school a lot. Uh, we also talked about uh, love, a loving community and that um, particularly, I guess, in middle school and high school, so many of our students are trying to figure out their identities that uh, that was yet another challenge um, that we had to um, recognize that um, and um, and and uh, and embrace all of the various identities of our students in in that mm -hmm. loving community. Mm -hmm. Oops. Who else? Anybody else? Thank you for sharing that, Roz. I think my group uh, was also focusing on towards the end when we were talking about dreaming of a of a school environment um, from a, a freedom perspective of the the foundational necessity of love that if without people for whom that's a guiding principle, uh, you, you, you're sort of stopped before you even get started. Um, and, the, and how powerful the, the presence of love in all of our lives is, but particularly young people. Um, and and they, they know when they're loved, that mm -hmm. comes through. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's something that we were talking about. Um, and also just the idea that uh, one of our group members was talking about the, the way in which um, we as a human community are, are of a piece, that we're a body, and that if a part of us is hurting, it's communicated oh, sure. throughout the entire, the entire group. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's not something that you, that this, that, that this, the idea of separation is is uh, illusory. That that in fact we are there is one boat, and we are all in it. You know, Shelley, um, I'd like to add to that because um, Ross was talking about high school and, and middle school. I worked in one um, elementary building where the administrator, the building principal, set the tone of love, respect, and acceptance um, in an extremely diverse. Um, school population wise, not staff wise, the staff was predominantly white, but population wise in terms of the students. And it, it made such a world of difference um, when the administrator could made it clear that all of these young people are worthy of love and respect. And she held <laughs> Our, our feet to the fire to say, to make sure that we demonstrated that. And again, you know, I had the role of school counselor. So I was in a really neat position to be able to set that tone among the young children um, that they were valuable and that their contributions and no matter what their background was, you know, that they were to be respected, accepted, and loved. And that love makes such a difference. The only way that we could really do this work cross-racially, and I've said this many times, is only through love. You can't do it any other way. And it's that love that we have to have for our humanity, our shared humanity. My dear brother Bob and our group shared that perfectly, that we've got to love each other if we're going to have a loving world. So examine our own hearts and figure out what it is that we that gets in the way of me not loving someone else you know that's on me so check out check ourselves out first yeah and Joyce and thank you and also Bob I mean in our group um share with us how he been coming to our organization he had learned a lot and wants to make a change and he wants to find him some African-American friends. So Bob had been invited these by two of us 
to meet and so we can um, have this dialogue of having him be able to meet somebody who don't look like him and have a, be a friend. So I'm just letting you know, um, I am very proud of him just speaking up how he has taken the message that not our town, um, been going out and doing and it put nothing but, I feel for Bob, love as every human being and um, for him to share that uh, I'm just so grateful for that because this is more that we need to bring towards our school system and our community. And for him to step out like that, I, I'm just really, my heart was just touched. And like I said, whoever in the chat got his number, we're going to call you. <laughs> so thank you. I want to also just once more uh, invite friends to hold up Ashley in, in gratitude. I really loved that she started off by reminding us that we are living beings, that we can rely on our breath, and that our work towards a world in which we, we can work towards a world in which we rely on each other and where our, our shared love of young people can provide us with the fuel we need to, she said, resist, disrupt, and take action. Very, very powerful. I, I do have one comment. One of the most important things I learned from Not In Our Town was the inconvenient truth. And how important it is for us to teach history as it actually occurred. And I think since we're talking about schools, to me, that's one of the biggest issues. Let's get this right. Because, uh, you know, there's too many white people like myself who learned another narrative. And, you know, I'm not gonna take full blame for that, but I, now that I know the truth, I will. And so I think there has to be some, you know, people call that cancel culture. That is such a big cop out. The truth is the truth. And if you deny it, you'll continue to get what we've got. You know, we're very dysfunctional now in this country and people need to start talking about that. <laughs> we need to talk to each other and come up with solutions not just criticize each other and be, you know, uh, nasty. I mean, it seems like that's the, the way to do business now. Just how can you put that person down? And they're to blame for everything that, uh, that goes on. So um, anyhow, thank you again for letting me know uh, the inconvenient truth. Thanks very much, Bob. I wanna thank everybody for taking time out of your evening this evening to be with us here tonight for our continuing conversations on race and white privilege. And of course the continuing means that we will be gathering here again next month in May. Just a sneak preview, uh, we will be hearing in May from Lynn Burnett, who is also a, a former teacher. We seem to like learning from teachers. They know what they're doing. Uh, and he has a project called Cross-Cultural Solidarity. And he's going to be talking about that project uh, and his experiences with it. At the core of Cross-Cultural Solidarity's vision is that multiracial unity is strengthened when we know one another's histories. So, uh, and, and when we get to see powerful examples of embodied solidarity. Um, that should be a really great conversation. I want to encourage everyone to take what you've learned here in this space tonight into the rest of the spaces in the rest of your life and to come back next month with a friend for us here. Uh, and thank you again to everyone for coming out and to the Princeton Public Library for their continuing partnership. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful thank evening. You. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you.